All right, we're going to resume where we left off at GI, and then we will break for lunch. I don't know if, it, if it's just uh, Rick's sense of humor, but I always seem to do this GI session right before lunch, so we'll, we'll talk about some things as you head off. So we left off when we were talking about, uh, just before we got to bowel perforation, so we'll talk a, a bit about free air under the diaphragm and bowel perf as you flip back. A couple key points here. What's the, most o- what's the most common overall cause of visceral perforation? It's still pelvic, uh, or <laughs> uh, peptic ulcer disease. Peptic ulcer disease is still the number one cause of visceral perforation. But if you specifically talk about large versus small bowel, large bowel perforations do occur a bit more commonly than small bowel perforations. So large bowel perforations can be a bit worse in that sense, in, in that they, uh, they perf more often than the small bowel. Um, causes of bowel perf... Other things, diverticulitis is probably the most common. Appendicitis occasionally, especially very young and very old. We'll talk more about appendicitis in just a little bit. And x-rays are probably going to be your key diagnostic test to look for on the board exam. CAT scan makes it very easy, but on the board exam, look for the free air under the diaphragm. This is a very, very obvious cause. I don't think they would give you something that obvious. More commonly under the right hemidiaphragm, it can be relatively subtle. You take a look up here, there's just a little sliver of free air right there. Try to make sure you're getting an upright PA and lateral chest x-ray. There's some articles that say that maybe the lateral view is a bit more sensitive. I don't think there's enough literature out there to say that one is definitely better than the other, but in general, definitely try to get an upright chest x-ray, and if you can, get both the PA and lateral. Now, what if your patient is too sick to stand up? No problem. Just have them lay in the left lateral decubitus position so the air can kind of filter up to the right upper quadrant as they're laying in the left lateral DQ position. And then when they go over to radiology, tell the radiology tech that you want them to shoot the very first film as a lateral D cube, and then they can start moving them around. But the first film should be a lateral D cube. And what you're gonna look for is air right up there under the costal margin between the liver and the rib cage. And there's some studies actually that say that the lateral D cube is even better than the upright chest X-ray. So again, I don't know that you'd have to know which is the best film, but if the patient can't stand up, make sure to get a lateral decubitus x-ray, okay? There's not a whole lot to say about constipation. Uh, In general, I would say at ABM General Hospital, on that board exam, benign diagnoses are never gonna be your answer. So for example, if somebody's presenting with abdominal pain, constipation, I think, is enormously unlikely to be your answer. Somebody comes in with uh, reflux symptoms. We talked about that already. It's not reflux. I can't imagine they will ever give you a question where you, they want you to pick the benign, benign diagnosis when there's deadly other things. So what would you get as a potential question on constipation? Well, you think about some of the other, you know, neuro or endocrine type of causes of constipation. Of course, in real life, the most common cause of constipation is just a rotten Western diet, low fiber, high protein, high fat type of stuff. But on the board exam, think about hypothyroidism, think about hypoparathyroidism, think about lead toxicity or other type of neurologic dysfunction. Uh, And treatment, again, just improve the diet for the most part. Enough about constipation. Uh, One slide on irritable bowel syndrome, not to be confused with inflammatory bowel syndrome, which we'll get to in a moment, but irritable bowel syndrome gives you alternating episodes of diarrhea and constipation. This is one of the more common causes or one of the more, a lot of people believe it's one of the more commonly um, underdiagnosed causes of abdominal pain. Oftentimes these patients end up being diagnosed with abdominal pain of uncertain cause and people believe it may be irritable bowel syndrome. There may be some association with certain psychiatric conditions including anxiety, but again, I think you're you're more likely to get questions about inflammatory bowel disease. This includes Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. This one slide right here talks about the similarities and the next couple of slides will describe some of the differences between Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So in what ways are these both fairly similar? Well, number one, they both tend to be chronic diseases. They both tend to have a relatively high rate of colon cancer over the next one to two decades. They tend to present with exacerbating and remitting patterns. They both tend to occur in relatively young, otherwise healthy adults. They both are often associated with extra intestinal manifestations, and I would highlight that for sure. Things like arthritis, there's dermatologic manifestations, for example, erythema nodosum, 
pyoderma, gangrenosum, hepatobiliary disease, vasculitis, and uveitis. I highlight uveitis. I think that would make for a great visual question where perhaps they give you a photo of somebody's eye uh, and the eye shows a classic signs of uveitis with photophobia and all the rest. And they say, oh, by the way, this patient's also been having some bloody diarrhea. And you need to think about uh, some of this inflammatory bowel disease, specifically ulcerative colitis. Both CD and UC tend to be treated fairly similarly with sulfa, salazine, mesalamine. With severe episodes, they oftentimes will get put on prednisone and sometimes you'll add some antibiotics as well. So again, this slide represents the ways in which they're very similar. Next couple slides, we'll talk about in what ways they're different. And I think it is important to know the differences between the two. So if if it's not intuitive, just make a little chart that separates the differences between the two. So as we go through this slide, I'm going to summarize both of them. First of all, Crohn's disease tends to involve the full thickness of the bowel wherever it is involved. So full thickness. In contrast, ulcerative colitis is more mucosal and submucosal. So that's one way they differ. Crohn's disease tends to give you skip lesions whereas ulcerative colitis is continuous. So for example, Crohn's disease, you might have a little involvement of the esophagus, and then it skips down to the jejunum, and then it skips the rest of the small bowel and goes all the way to the, the, the large bowel, and then maybe there's some rectal involvement. So it can skip around to different areas of the GI system, whereas ulcerative colitis only involves the colon, as the name would imply, and wherever you have ulcerative colitis, it tends to be continuous. There's no normal areas of bowel bet between involved areas with ulcerative colitis. It's a continuous involvement. And then the other way that they differ in terms of blood in the stool, ulcerative colitis probably 90, 95% of cases gives you bloody diarrhea or bloody stool, whereas Crohn's disease, probably less than 50% of patients will give you blood in the diarrhea. And then one other thing to keep in mind about Crohn's disease, Crohn's tends to be associated with calcium oxalate stones. So again, I think that makes for a nice board question of if you get a patient coming in with uh, kidney stones, and by the way, they've also been having uh, alternating episodes of, or remitting episodes of lower GI symptoms than you think about Crohn's disease, all right? So here's your slide on ulcerative colitis, and we've talked about all of these already. Once again, ulcerative colitis only involves the colon. Crohn's can be anywhere. Ulcerative colitis, only colon. Um, this tends to always, pretty much always be associated with bloody diarrhea. Crohn's, less than 50%. You see, almost 100%. One other way that they differ is that toxic megacolon, either one can develop toxic megacolon, but it's far more common with, with ulcerative colitis. And these patients tend to be a lot sicker. Ulcerative colitis patients, when it's bad, can get a lot sicker than the Crohn's patient. And then as I mentioned before, what part of the bowel is involved? Crohn's disease, full thickness of the bowel, whereas ulcerative colitis primarily just is mucosal and submucosal involvement. And I mentioned a couple slides ago that both of these can be associated with cancer over the next few decades. It's a lot higher with ulcerative colitis. It's about 30 times higher than normal patients. Mesenteric ischemia is definitely a big ticket item on that board exam. Again, again in real life, it's not that common. I'm, I'm sure we all think of it probably every day. We at least think of mesenteric ischemia but it's not that common. Whereas at ABEM General Hospital, you're gonna see a lot of this. Any elderly patient showing up with abdominal pain, you've gotta put mesenteric ischemia along with AAA. Put them right at the top of your differential, right? You've gotta think about this. The classic presentation is that classic pain out of proportion of physical findings. The patient's laying in the stretcher, they're rocking back and forth, they're miserable, they look terrible, and yet you push on their belly and it's really not that tender. It's a pain out of proportion of physical findings. The typical type of patient you're gonna see is somebody who has either a low flow state, like a severe cardiomyopathy type of patient, multiple MIs in the past, and the result is that they just have low flow and so they develop clots in the heart and then they embolize those clots. Or a patient with atrial fibrillation clearly is gonna be at risk for embolization as well. So any AFib patient that develops abdominal pain, any severe cardiomyopathy patient that develops abdominal pain, anybody that you have on pressors for sepsis, for example, if, you're, if you've got a patient in septic shock, you put them on norepi and a couple of hours later, they start developing abdominal pain. That's a low flow state. You've gotta think about mesenteric ischemia and potential for mesenteric infarction. What are the lab tests? Most of them are very nonspecific. 
the lactate tends to probably be the most sensitive test and starts rising relatively early. Of course, lactate's very nonspecific, but it starts rising relatively early, and probably a more specific test is marked, marked leukocytosis. All right. Now, I'm not a big proponent or believer in the utility of the white count. I've told all my residents for 20 some years, the white count is the last refuge of the intellectually destitute, right? You never use a white count to rule in or rule out anything. Maybe neutropenic fever, you need a white count. But most of the time, white count is just a totally useless test. In this scenario, what you'll probably get is white counts that are markedly elevated. Ischemia is a tremendous demarginator. So you can get white counts of 25, 30, 40,000. Right? 10, 15, 18,000, I don't care. But when it starts getting up to 25, 30, 40,000, then with belly pain, you're starting to think about mesenteric ischemia. Plain films are very nonspecific. This arrow is supposed to be sitting on top of a thickened loop of bowel. Sometimes it's referred to as thumb printing because the bowel wall looks like a thumb. It's very, very thick, which is much more obvious on CAT scan. We'll see in just a moment. The other thing you'll see on plain film. We talked about this already, air in the right upper quadrant. There should never be air in the right upper quadrant. If you see air in the right upper quadrant, there's two things to think about, emphysematous cholestitis and mesenteric ischemia. Either way, that's an immediate surgery consult and they're going to the OR as quickly as possible. So that's another thing to look for. You'll also notice there's an ileus pattern down here and we talked about how ileus is very, very nonspecific. But that air in the right upper quadrant that's the real big concern here. Here's a few CAT scans that really show you just how thick that bow wall is. Take a look at how thick the bow wall is. Normally bow wall is just paper thin. Look how thick this is, all right? Sometimes you can get air within thickened bow wall. That's called pneumatosis intestinalis. You see that thick bow wall and there's little bits of air in the bow wall. And then this is a CAT scan showing air within the hepatobiliary system. This is air in the right upper quadrant. Okay, if you see air in the hepatobiliary system, there's two things to think about for the third time, emphysematous cholestitis and mesenteric ischemia. Either way, they're going to the operating room. Now, your most important test, your diagnostic test of choice is traditional angiogram. Now, I'm not talking about CT angiogram. CT angiogram's pretty good, but still not as good at diagnosis as the traditional angiogram. And you've got to push for angio. And again, those of you that are going to be taking the oral boards next year, this is one of those tests where they're going to see how resilient and how much, uh, how much advocacy you, you are doing for your patient, where you've got to really push for that diagnostic angiogram. And the other important thing about a traditional angiogram, not only is it diagnostic, but it's also therapeutic. Because while you're doing the angio, you can instill some local vasodilators like papaverin or local thrombolytics and break apart the clot. You can't do that with CT angio. You've got to do traditional angio. And that's why traditional angio is so important. And yet, I, I know we all have a tough time getting it. How many of you have been able, at overnight, been able to call interventional radiology to come on in and do an angiogram on someone in the past couple of years? Yeah, it does happen. People, it's a handful. Good for you. But... You know, people go into interventional radiology. I've never understood this. You go into interventional radiology just to do this procedure, and, and then you can't do it, especially at nighttime, even at a big tertiary care place. So I finally figured out, for those people wondering why they won't come in at nighttime, I figured it out. We, our radiology area is right across, from the hall, across the hall from the emergency department. One day I went over to radiology to ask them a question about a patient, it was very dark, and as my eyes adjusted, I could see that the radiologists were all sitting around flipping through some Mercedes and BMW catalogs. And I, I, I sat there, I didn't want to interrupt them. I picked up one of these catalogs and I started flipping through and looking at the cars that they buy. And then I realized the reason radiologists can't come in at nighttime is because they buy cars that have no headlights. Now it all makes sense finally. So anyway, but on this exam, you've got to push for that angiogram. Take a look at how diagnostic, how easy it is to see the diagnosis here on angiogram. You've got a nice column of dye and then bam, nothing after that. Um, this is a, an example of non-occlusive mesenteric ischemia. This is a patient that has diffuse vasoconstriction of a lot of vessels. This is the type of thing that you might see, say, in your septic patient 
who's on a presser, like a norepinephrine drip, and now the patient starts developing severe abdominal pain. This is the type of thing that you might see, just diffuse vasoconstriction due to the norepinephrine. So you, you've got to be on the lookout for this. If your patient is on vasopressors and then develops abdominal pain, this is what you're going to have to worry about. All right, let me go back for a second. The other thing I want to mention, I mentioned uh, atrial fibrillation with abdominal pain is mesenteric ischemia until proven otherwise. Uh, cardiomyopathy with abdominal pain. Persons on oppressors who develops abdominal pain. The one other thing that you see down there at the bottom is digoxin. And this is not well known, but digoxin has been found to be an independent uh, predictor of mesenteric ischemia because digoxin produces a small amount of splanchnic vasoconstriction. So if they give you a patient who's on dig who then develops abdominal pain, please think about mesenteric ischemia. All right? All right, another little mental break here. Um, this uh, was sent to me by somebody in England, all right, and take a guess what city this is from. You're sitting in it, <laughs> right? So I think the caption out here was something about father and son bonding time, I guess. All right, let's talk about appendicitis. Appendicitis is the most common cause of surgical abdomen in our population. No surprise to anybody here. Uh, and there's not a lot to say about appendicitis that you don't already know. The classic presentation, periumbilical pain that over the course of, say, 24, 36 hours gradually migrates to the right lower quadrant. It's associated with nausea, vomiting, classically anorexia, low-grade fever, elevated white count. All of that's very classic. Classic is not always going to show up on the board exam. It's not always right lower quadrant. If the appendix is retrocecal, you can get right low back pain. All right. If the appendix is uh, touching the ureter, you might drop red cells into the urine and get microscopic hematuria, which makes it very easy to misdiagnose as renal colic. If the appendix is near the bladder, it might cause a little bladder inflammation and produce white cells in the urine, and it's easy to misdiagnose as UTI. So you never call something UTI unless there's white cells and bacteria, and you wouldn't want to call it if it's more right lower quadrant. Cystitis usually is more suprapubic pain. Right? So just be careful about those misdiagnoses. Renal colic and cystitis are common, and also right low back pain, right musculoskeletal pain. Right? Be careful about the white count, up to 45% of patients. Don't worry about the number, just the concept. Up to 45% of patients can have normal white counts with an appy. Right? Um, don't, don't focus on fever. A lot of patients with appy have fever. Nausea and vomiting, kind of plus minus, fever plus minus. Anorexia is the biggest pet peeve of all. The biggest myth. I had appendicitis when I was a fourth year medical student, and honest, honest to God, as they wheeled me up to the operating room, the one thing I wanted more than anything was a thick, greasy slice of pepperoni pizza. I mean, I was starving. We had a resident a number of years ago who went to the operating room for an appy, and for the first half an hour that he was in the OR, the first half an hour they spent suctioning out of his stomach an entire Denny's Grand Slam breakfast he had just eaten, right? Um, and so be very careful. And a lot of the junior level surgery residents in particular still really focus on anorexia. There's, I don't know if you've heard this cheeseburger sign, right? Where they'll offer a cheeseburger to the patient. And if the patient says, yeah, I, want, I would eat it. Hey, I just ruled out appendicitis, right? How crazy is that? So I remember a case uh, back when I was uh, mid nineties or so out of residency. And so midnight, nowadays everybody gets CAT scans. So back, but that back then we weren't able to get CAT scans on everybody. So we used to have to do this other thing. I'm blanking on the name. Oh, um, uh, history and physical, right? So we actually have to evaluate these patients. And sometimes just based on the history and physical, you would get a surgery consult. And unbelievably, sometimes surgery would actually admit people just for OBS. Some of you may remember that. So anyway, this one night, it was around 11 o'clock at night, I had a young woman who, come in, who came in with right lower quadrant pain. And honestly, I wasn't that worried about an appy, but I, th I thought I should probably get a consult. So I called surgery, and it happened to be a fourth year surgery resident who was rotating through. And as soon as I saw him, I knew she wasn't being admitted because this guy had a reputation for being a wall. He never wanted to admit anything unless they were about to die. So he comes down. He walks into the room, does a quick history and physical, then comes running out of the room, gets on the phone in front of me, and he calls up his attending at 11 o'clock at night, and he says, you got to come in. She's got to go right to the OR. She's got a hot appy. So he hangs up. He's writing these pre-op orders on this patient. And I thought, man, I must have really missed something. So I said to him, you know, honestly, I wasn't that concerned about this one. What? Why are you? I think it's great you're being aggressive, taking her to the OR, but 
what, what is it that you picked up that made you really concerned? And true story, he said, I offered her a cheeseburger and she said no, right? <laughs> and then I said to him, well, did you know that she's vegan? <laughs> so, so, so true story, right? So he, he didn't know what that was. It was 90s or so. So I explained it to him. So he goes back in the room, does a little more history, and they ended up just obsing her, and she ended up doing fine. But probably the only time in my career that a, a social history has been worth a damn. All right. And so, so if they give you a plain film that shows an appendicolith, consider it a gift. All right. If you've got abdominal pain plus an appendicolith, it's, it's very highly predictive that they do have a hot appy. All right. But appendicolis are relatively rare. They say maybe about 5% of patients with an appy will have an appendicolis, so don't count on that, all right? There's a handful of confounders. During pregnancy, late pregnancy in particular, the appendix can get pushed higher up in the abdomen, so it's not always right lower, maybe right mid or right upper quadrant. I mentioned already if the appendix is retrocecal, you can get right low back pain. We talked a little bit about the misdiagnosis of renal colic, the misdiagnosis of UTI, and you know, Rothstein sign, so is sign, obturator sign. Again, if they give you those on the exam, consider it a gift and go for the appy. But I'm betting they probably won't give that to you. Rectal tenderness. I think rectal exam as a routine part of the evalu evaluation is pretty much out. So I can't imagine that they would require you to do that. But if they say that on rectal exam, on the right side, there's more tenderness or a mass, this is what they want you to think about. And again, there's your misdiagnosis of UTI. Uh, pregnancy, this is the most common reason for surgery, the non-OB cause of, of surgery during pregnancy. So pregnant patients are still at the same risk of developing an appy, and if there's a delay in the diagnosis, then that can be deadly to, uh, to the fetus. So you need to really stay on top of appendicitis in um, pregnancy as well. All right, switching over to the left lower quadrant, everything I just said about appendicitis can be restated for diverticulitis in the left lower quadrant. Similar misdiagnoses, similar presentations, and similar rate of non-classic presentations as well. Diverticular disease, just a little terminology here. Diverticular disease is the name of the overall disease where you have diverticuli in, in the colon. And when you have diverticular disease, you can develop one of three complications. You can develop bleeding, which is called diverticulosis. You can develop inflammation and pain, that's called diverticulitis. And you can develop PERF, which is called PERF. <laughs> All right, so those are the three complications. People tend to use the term diverticulosis for everything. But again, diverticulosis really implies that it's diverticular disease that's bleeding. All right, um, it can mimic appendicitis if you have right lower quadrant diverticular disease, but that's relatively uncommon in the US. So I think they're gonna give you somebody with left lower quadrant pain who comes in with some vague lo localized left lower quadrant pain, some nausea, vomiting, plus or minus white count. And again, there's your three complications at the top, right? Uh, perf, overall perf is relatively rare, but if you specifically ask what are the common causes of large bowel perf, this probably leads to PAC. Uh, if, if the diverticulum is near the bladder, you can drop some white cells into the urine and mimic UTI. You may even have a little dysuria or frequency. But as I mentioned before, don't diagnose UTI unless there's white cells and good bacteria on a good specimen. Just be careful about that. Right? How do you treat these patients? Well, if they're sick or have peritonitis, they're coming in, they're going to the OR. If they're not sick, you can send them home. I think that's totally acceptable. And usually, if you diagnose diverticulitis in somebody and they don't have a concerning abdominal exam, they look good, they've got good follow-up, you send them home, what you want to use is, say, um, amoxclavulenic acid or augmentin. I think that would be perfect. You want to cover gram negatives and anaerobes. Another choice, if they're penallergic, you could use like Cipro plus metronidazole. So again, no, no big secrets there. And most of you probably do that routinely. And then high fiber diet, analgesics, and, uh, and so on. Again, you want to cover gram negatives and anaerobes. All right, finishing things up. Before lunch, the last 20 minutes or so, we've got to talk about diarrhea. Huh, such great timing, all right? So I'm, I'm just gonna, uh, while we're on this slide, I'm just gonna summarize some general concepts about diarrhea, then we're gonna get into specifics. And I think with regards to diarrhea, my guess is that they're probably gonna want you to know the bug. So we're gonna talk about some key features that 
when you see these key features, bells should go off and point you towards the bug, all right? So first of all, there's two major types of diarrhea. There's viral and bacterial. And bacterial can be broken down into two classes. There's toxigenic, and then there's the invasive kind, all right? In terms of red cells and white cells, the only type is, that's gonna give you red cells and white cells are the invasive bacteria. Viruses don't give you red cells and white cells or bloody diarrhea. The toxigenic bacteria don't give you bloody diarrhea, all right? So keep those things separate in mind. The other thing to keep in mind, the invasive bacteria, and I'm gonna recap all of this as we go through the slides, all right? But the invasive bacteria tend to give you gradual onset of symptoms. You know, you start kind of feeling rotten and maybe some low grade fevers and myalgias, and then the diarrhea starts, oftentimes bloody diarrhea, and, and it gradually goes away, or you can take some antibiotics and it gradually goes away. The toxigenic bacteria, you can be feeling totally normal and then bam, suddenly you're rushing to the bathroom and you're having a lot of watery, non-bloody, non-white cell type of diarrhea. There is no prodrome of fever or anything else like that. It just hits you from out of the blue and then it, it fortunately tends to resolve fairly quickly. Viruses are kind of in between, maybe a little prodrome, maybe not. But again, like I said earlier, viruses, no blood and no white cells, all right? So those are just some general concepts and we'll restate those as we go through the, the following slides. So first, let's talk about viruses. There's probably two major types of viruses to be on the lookout for. There's the rotavirus, which occurs in really young kids, and then there's the Norwalk or norovirus, which occurs in, in older kids and adults. Uh, Key feature, what your tip off for Norwalk virus, you know, think about cruise ships, um, where a lot of people are, are exposed. This is the classic cruise ship diarrhea. Again, every year you hear about some outbreak on a cruise where, where hundreds of passengers or thousands of passengers need to be quarantined. And, and um, so this is one of those things that people that work on cruise boats always fear the most. How many of you have been on a cruise before? So, so you know that when, before you're allowed to get on the boat, you have to fill out a little questionnaire. Have you had any nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea in the past few days? If you have, you check off this box and we offer you a free visit to our ship's doctor. What they don't tell you up front though is the ship's doctor is on shore while the boat is leaving. <laughs> All right, they're not gonna let you on. Um, and in fact, if you develop this on the boat, they'll quarantine you. Well, my parents went on a Mediterranean cruise with their best friend from California who they hadn't seen in a long time, and their best friend developed some diarrhea on the cruise, so she talked to the ship's doctor and they promptly quarantined her for the entire cruise. And she missed the whole thing. So bottom line is if you get diarrhea on a cruise, don't tell anybody, all right? <laughs> Just take your Imodium, take some Cipro with you and enjoy yourself as best you can, all right? Um, okay, so let's talk about the bacteria. Once again, bacteria, there's enteroinvasive and enterotoxigenic. What did we say about enterovasive? Prodrome, fever, feel rotten, and over the course of a day or two, then the symptoms develop, the diarrhea develops, and then it gradually resolves, or you can take some antibiotics, maybe it gets better a day faster. Invasive, since it invades the colon, you get white cells and you may get blood. The toxigenic, no blood, no red cells, abrupt onset, and it goes away relatively quickly. Okay, so what I'm gonna do as we go through these bugs, I'm just gonna talk briefly, and I've highlighted in red probably the key words that you need to know about these. First of all, E. coli 0157H7, this is the enterinvasive type of E. coli that you've got to worry about. It can be hemorrhagic, bloody diarrhea is the key. Again, every year or two you hear about some big outbreak from some local restaurant. You know, uh, Chipotle's was the last one I remember hearing about. Sometimes this is E. coli that's linked to, uh, to lettuce. We had that recall on lettuce, I think last year was it? Um, and, and so what, what you worry about is the bloody diarrhea. The sequelae of the E. coli diarrhea are a big concern as well. Young kids can get HUS, hemolytic urine syndrome. Elderly can get TTP. Now, in reality, young, otherwise healthy adults, most everybody here, you, you probably just suffer a little bit and do okay, all right? Bloody diarrhea, you feel rotten, but the HUS generally is in really young, TTP really in, in much older patients. And because there's some studies saying that antibiotics may increase the likelihood of HUS, 
in kids, they extrapolated that and in general say, if you have bloody diarrhea, don't use antibiotics. But that's really largely extrapolation based on concerns that antibiotics may increase HUS in kids. But they extrapolated and said, you know what, if you see bloody diarrhea, don't give antibiotics to anybody, all right? Um, you get this from undercooked beef, specifically um, chopped beef, like burgers, all right? Can you, can you get this from steak? Eh, not so much, all right? And the reason is that largely this comes from, I hate to say this, but it comes from the cow's poop which gets ground into the burger. And if the burger is not cooked all the way through, that's why on all those menus, you always see the little warnings there about uh, making sure things get cooked all the way through. If it's not cooked all the way through, the E. coli can survive in the burger. But with the steak, if you just cook each side a little bit, you know, you're fine. So key point, eat steak, <laughs> all right? <laughs> Skip the burger while you're here in Vegas, go for the steak, all right? Shigella and salmonella. Shigella, again, bloody diarrhea. And the classic story here is it's a febrile kid who has bloody diarrhea. Maybe you're just about to do the LP because it's a first time febrile seizure and then they start having bloody diarrhea. And the reason is that Shigella is associated with um, a neurotoxin that can produce these febrile seizures. So a kid with febrile seizures with bloody diarrhea, bam, Shigella, all right? Salmonella, salmonella is associated with poorly cooked chicken. It's often associated with amphibians, pet turtles, um, pet snakes, and, and it's one of the reasons why those are no longer, it's no longer legal to import them. A lot of people do anyway, but you're not supposed to uh, import these pet turtles and pet snakes and so on. Um, again, you, you hear about this in undercooked chicken as well. And uh, again, because this is an encapsulated organism, patients with sickle cell anemia are going to be at higher risk for developing osteomyelitis from salmonella. That's a little bit separate from diarrhea anyway, but I figured I'd throw that in there since we're talking about salmonella. Either one of these can be treated with Cipro, all right? So keep those treatments in mind. Campylobacter, Campylobacter currently is the most common cause of bacterial diarrhea in the US. Sometimes it's salmonella, but Campylobacter right now is winning out. It can give you lower abdominal pain. Sometimes it's confused for inflammatory bowel disease because of the bloody diarrhea and abdominal cramps. And this is kind of a neat feature here. Uh, that acute infection can be associated with subsequent development of Guillain-Barre. So here's a question. Let's say a person comes into the emergency department and they've got ascending hyperreflexia. You diagnose Guillain-Barre and oh, by the way, a couple months ago, they had some bloody diarrhea. Again, bells should go off. You'd start thinking about Campylobacter. All right, at the bottom of the slide, Vibrio. Well, you know about Vibrio cholera. That's the toxigenic, we'll get to that. But Vibrio is associated with two types of invasive bacteria also, Vibrio perihemolyticus and Vibrio vulnificus. Both of these invasive Vibrios are associated with brackish water, like Gulf Coast water, uh, oysters, clams, things like that. You hear about outbreaks every now and then. And that's the main thing to think about. Um, for the most part, they tend to be self-limited. As an aside, non-diarrhea aside, uh, Vibrio vulnificus is also associated with some really terrible wound infections. And we'll see that in our neck of the woods also. There's people out on the Chesapeake Bay who get a cut from a boat propeller or maybe a clam shucker. So people that try to pry open and pop open those clams get cut on the clam shell. And if there's Vibrio, if Vibrio infects the wound, they can develop awful, awful wounds to the point that they need chronic antibiotics and, and plastic surgery has to get involved, they get skin flaps and, and so on. So pretty nasty wound infections from vulnificus as well. But again, Vibrio, there's two types of invasive, perihelminticus, vulnificus, both associated with oysters, clams, things like that. Yersinia, Yersinia enterocolitica. Key thing here, it mimics appendicitis. Crampy abdominal pain, right lower quadrant pain. If they give you a patient that looks and sounds like appendicitis, who also is having bloody diarrhea, think about Yersinia, all right? Uh, again, white cells, red cells, bloody, and treatment is supportive, but you can treat these patients with quinolones or Bactrim can be helpful as well. Now switching over to the toxigenic. Remember, toxigenic type of bacteria, there's no blood, there's no white cells, there's no fever prodrome, and the onset is very quick, sometimes six or 10 or 12 hours. The invasive ones usually take a day or so. These ones can hit you pretty quick, 
and you go from totally normal, feeling fine, to bam, suddenly you've got watery diarrhea making you miserable for a little while, all right? Staph aureus, staph is the, the classic type of toxigenic diarrhea, and this is often associated with protein-rich foods, potato salads, cream-filled pastries, food that's at a banquet or maybe a summer picnic that's left out poor, uh, poorly or unrefrigerated for too long. Symptoms can develop within three, four, six hours or so, and fortunately it's self-limited and ends up going away. It's associated with improper refrigeration. Here's E. coli back again. Earlier we talked about the E. coli invasive type. This is E. coli toxigenic type. This is the most common cause of traveler's diarrhea. Um, patients who travel abroad to third world countries oftentimes get watery diarrhea early during their visit, and this is the likely cause. This can be treated with Bactrim or Cipro, which presumably may kill the bacteria that's producing the toxins. And sometimes people recommend Pepto-Bismol as prophylaxis. Um, Anti-peristaltic agents like Imodium tend to work very well for these patients as well. Again, keywords is uh, traveler's diarrhea, all right? Clostridium perfringes can um, produce this toxigenic diarrhea. And key thing here is casseroles, stews, gravies, steamed table meats. You know, think about this as if there's an outbreak at a school uh, uh, from a cafeteria food, all right? So there's not, not much else special about this, but there's really nothing, no other bacteria that typically gets linked to gravies and stews. So that's kind of the way I think of it, all right? Antibiotics usually don't work. It tends to be self-limited. Vibrio cholera, everybody here knows about cholera, rice water diarrhea. All you can do for these patients is support their hydration status, support their electrolytes. The World Health Organization has some oral hydration formulas. There's some data that says maybe some antibiotics can decrease the duration, all right? But the main thing that you're gonna do is just support them, their hydration status. Next up, be serious. Bacillus serious. This tends to be associated with Chinese food, fried rice in particular. And there's actually two types. There's an emetic type, and then there's a diarrhea type. Both of these start within several hours of ingestion. With the emetic type, it's primarily a lot of vomiting that fortunately self-resolves. With the diarrhea type, there's a lot of watery diarrhea that fortunately self-resolves after a number of hours. And because these are usually associated with Chinese food, you end up hungry all over again very quickly, though. So. All right. And then there's a couple of uh, pretty cool neuro or, or pretty cool seafood related type of, um, of toxins. There's scombroid and ciguatera. Don't get these confused. So scombroid first. Scombroid is associated with deep ocean fish, tuna, mackerel, mahi, mahi, typically associated with improper refrigeration. You can, it's, it's from a histamine-like toxin that accumulates in these fish and persists because they're not refrigerated properly. Oftentimes people will say that the fish tasted particularly um, peppery or had a very metallic type of taste and they come in with this overwhelming histamine reaction. They've got urticaria, they've got re wheezing, they're itching all over. How do you treat them? Use antihistamines, right? H1 and H2 blockers, if they're wheezing, give them some nebs. Symptoms tend to resolve very quickly. I'm convinced that this is a more common cause of seafood allergy than we've previously recognized. You know, working in Baltimore, there's seafood everywhere and there's people that come in saying, I developed a new allergy to seafood two years ago. They've been eating seafood their whole life and suddenly they developed an allergy. No, in all likelihood, they probably had some scombroid uh, poisoning and they're probably not allergic. When you suspect this though, make sure you, that you call the restaurant and tell them what's going on and maybe the health department also. Otherwise, there's gonna be a lot more people with the same thing going on. And then the other interesting seafood one is ciguatera. With ciguatera, this is associated with ingestion of uh, toxins from these dinoflagellates. What happens is during times of red tide, there's a lot of dinoflagellates. Small fish eat these dinoflagellates. Medium-sized fish eat a lot of the small fish. Then the big predatory fish eat a lot of the medium fish. And so by the time these big predatory fish, the grouper, red snapper, barracuda, by the time it ends up on your dinner plate, it's got a lot of this dinoflagellate um, toxin in its flesh. You eat that, you end up getting uh, various neurologic manifestations, muscle weakness, paresthesias. Classically, you get reversal of hot and cold sensation. So I've seen this once where a patient put their hand on the bed rail, which is pretty cold, and it felt like it was burning hot. 
patient ran their hand under slightly warm water and it felt ice cold. So I don't really know the pathophys, but it's this reversal of hot cold sensation. We had another patient who, who had this sensation that her teeth were falling out and she actually had some, uh, but, but it was just a very, very bizarre, it's not common in Baltimore actually, but it's, it's just a bizarre set of neurologic manifestations and these can supposedly be treated with mannitol, amitriptyline. Patients need to avoid seafood and avoid alcohol for, the long, for a long duration because those can re-exacerbate those same symptoms, right? Um, Pseudomembranous intercolitis, in other words, C. diff. Again, this is something that we're all seeing more and more over the past 10 days or so. It's associated with chronic use of antibiotics, which changes the gut flora and as a result, you can end up with profuse watery diarrhea, sometimes bloody, but almost always it's watery diarrhea during this, because of this toxin. A key point there that I've highlighted is that you usually have to be on antibiotics for a minimum of seven to 10 days before you're at risk for this. And the antibiotic use can be maybe a month or two ago. It doesn't have to be current antibiotics. So if somebody comes in and says, yeah, I've been on this antibiotic for three days and, now, and I've got diffuse, uh, profuse diarrhea, that's not C. diff, all right? Because it's probably just a side effect of the antibiotic. They really need to be on the antibiotic for a lot longer than that. How do you treat these patients? It's gotta be oral metronidazole or oral vancomycin. And generally the recommendation is to avoid antidiarrheals. There are a couple of parasites to be aware of also, Giardia. Giardia is the most common cause of waterborne diarrheal outbreaks, uh, sometimes referred to as backpackers diarrhea. People who are out in the uh, backpacking or in the mountains may drink from mountain streams and they can contract this. Patients will have long-term symptoms for weeks or months until it's finally diagnosed and treated. And, and they talk about very, very painful abdominal cramps uh, a lot of bloating, frothy, very, very foul-smelling uh, stool. You know, I, I, I cavalierly made a joke. Well, I, I've never heard of anybody saying that their stool was pleasant in smell. Uh, and at this conference, somebody at the back of the auditorium raised their hand and says, just want you all to know, I've had Giardia, and it's really foul-smelling. So whatever. If anybody here has had diarrhea, keep it to yourself. All right. Um, <laughs> audible borborygmy, very, very loud bowel sounds as well. Treatment is uh, metronidazole. Usually it's pretty simple, but it takes a long time before it's discovered, and so patients can have symptoms for a long time. And then amebiasis, or entamoeba histolytica, uh, this is classically associated with liver abscesses. You all remember the amoebic liver, amoebic liver abscess. But interestingly, and something I didn't know, is that you can develop abscesses in multiple other areas as well. It doesn't just have to be the liver. It can be the liver, it can be the pericardium, it can be the, the lungs, it can be the brain. The, but the key thing is that this parasite produces abscesses in any one of those organs. And um, not so much diarrhea, but they can come in with abdominal pain and jaundice. And the only history you've got is maybe they're in a third world country where they contracted the, the cysts, all right? And then cryptosporidium. Cryptosporidium is a protozoan parasite. Key thing to know about cryptosporidium is that this is the most common cause of chronic diarrhea in immunocompromised patients, especially in AIDS. In fact, this is responsible for a lot of AIDS deaths and the patients die because of electrolyte problems and fluid loss. So this can cause a chronic wasting syndrome classically in AIDS and that's what I would look for. If they said di bad, bad diarrhea with wasting in AIDS, then you gotta think about cryptosporidium here. And there are a couple of treatments that you see at the bottom, uh, paromamycin plus azithromycin. And key thing, just like with cholera, you're supporting their hydration and electrolytes. Okay, last mental break before we finish things up in the last couple of minutes here um, for those skiers out there. This is the most bizarre ski sign up next. And I'm not really sure what this is supposed to be conveying, but whatever it is, don't do it, apparently. <laughs> All right. All right, it's from a, some European ski resort. Uh, okay, last couple things down at the rectum. Rectal prolapse, okay? I'm sure many of you have seen uh, patients with rectal prolapse before at university. We've got a couple of patients that intermittently come in when they have a prolapse. And, and you, what you need to do is distinguish rectal prolapse versus prolapse of an internal hemorrhoid, because obviously there's a big difference in treatment between somebody who has prolapse of intestine versus prolapse of an, uh, of an internal hemorrhoid. And what you're gonna look for that can supposedly be helpful is that with 
the hemorrhoid, you oftentimes see these, what they describe as spokes of a wheel radiating outward. So from the center going out. Whereas with, if it's bowel, you instead see more of, of a circular orientation from the bowel wall. If you have a patient with a prolapsed, ex, or prolapsed internal hemorrhoid, you want to try to reduce it and get surgery involved. If it's prolapse of bowel, or, or um, yeah, if it's prolapse of bowel, then you want to try to decrease the edema and it often will reduce itself. One of the things that you can do to reduce the edema, they say, is to pour sugar on it. Uh, and a lot of patients actually know this and they will themselves try pouring sugar on this. The sugar absorbs extra moisture, decreases edema. And as I've been told, I haven't seen this actually happen, but I've been told once the sugar absorbs the edema, it actually just pops right back in in many cases. I haven't been lucky enough to see that happen, usually with manual reduction, but I have seen the sugar trick work in the emergency department. And every year at this course, somebody says, comes up afterwards and says, well, what about NutraSweet? And I don't have an answer for you. <laughs> I don't know about the artificial sweeteners, but sugar really does work so well, in fact, that many of your patients will have already tried this at home by the time they, they come on in, all right? Uh, and then finally, hemorrhoids. And I'm not to say about hemorrhoids, except um, that, as you know, they're associated with poor diet, a lot of straining, constipation. If a patient has a thrombosed external hemorrhoid, you can numb it up and make it a little elliptical incision. If you're gonna numb it up, use lidocaine with epinephrine. The epi helps vasoconstrict a little bit, decrease the bleeding, and then a little elliptical incision pops out the clot, and patients will sometimes say it gives them immediate relief of their symptoms. The caveat here, you need to make sure absolutely that it is totally thrombosed. It's purple, very hard, uh, purple discoloration as well. If you ever, are unsure about whether it's totally thrombosed or not, please don't do this uh, because otherwise you're making an incision in a vessel and it's just gonna bleed indefinitely. And I remember when I was a fourth year medical student, my attending did this and the patient did not have a totally thrombosed hemorrhoid. And I spent the better part of my shift as a fourth year medical student holding ABD pads on someone's rectum for about six hours or so, all right? So really make sure that it's thrombosed. But you can make the elliptical incision if it's thrombosed. If it's not, um, Anusol, which with uh, Anusol HC, with HC stands for hydrocortisone, so local steroids can be helpful, sits baths, and, and so on, and then refer them to surgery for more definitive management. And the last point up here that I'll make it has to do with anal fissure. Uh, anal fissure is associated with severe lancinating type of pain. As the stool passes, the pain gradually improves over the next 10 minutes, but during the bowel movement is when it tends to hurt the most. Key thing here that I've highlighted, most, an, most physiologic fissures that occur due to constipation occur at the 12 or six o'clock position. If you ever see an anal fissure that's not at the 12 or six o'clock position, you've got to think about cancer, You've got to think about inflammatory bowel disease and you've got to think about sexual abuse. And I think that's, that would make for a really, really important visual type of question, all right? So keep those things in mind. Treatment, sits baths, nitroglycerin, topicals, and, uh, and so on. And with that, we'll conclude GI and I hope you all have a great lunch. I think you're back then at one o'clock, one o'clock. All right, see you back then.